So today we launch our new series on um, the family, uh, all in the family, I think is how uh, it's been framed, but it's basically a look at the genealogy of Jesus. Uh, we are going to look at several characters over the next few weeks, leading all the way up to Christmas. And believe it or not, it's going to be here in just seven or eight more weeks. So over the next six, seven weeks, we're going to focus on the key people in the genealogy of Jesus that came before him so that we appreciate, again, an understanding of what was in the past, all the way building up to the birth of Jesus. My prayer, my hope is as we journey through this over the next six, seven weeks, we will come to Christmas with a renewed, uh, tremendous appreciation and gratitude for who Jesus is and what Jesus really did for us. So today we're going to launch with the character of Adam. All right. Uh, Adam, I've never preached on Adam before, and I've, I can't say I've heard a sermon on Adam, right? So this is a, a, a groundbreaking for me. <laughs> but, but the point I want to make in this story of Adam is how God specializes in taking our messes and making our lives whole again. How God specializes in taking colossal messes and making our life redemptive and whole again. So of course, uh, before I, I launch in, right, uh, we have to first note that the genealogy appears in uh, two passages of scriptures in the gospel. So of course we have the genealogy in the gospel of Matthew, and we have the genealogy in the Gospel of Luke. Matthew, it comes in chapter one, and Luke, it comes in chapter three. Matthew's list begins with Jesus as the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And remember, he is writing to a Jewish audience. And so therefore, he is connecting to Abraham as the father of faith and David as the royal king. And of course, Jesus is presented as the Messiah, the Mashiach, the long awaited king who will restore the kingdom, right? He's presented as king. But very interestingly, he's presented as the son of Abraham, the son of David. Abraham, meaning the father of faith, which we will look at next week, and son of David, meaning the royal lineage, which we'll look at the following week. But then Matthew presents him that way. Luke, on the other hand, writing in the third chapter in Luke, Luke is, of course, a doctor. He is writing, as we understand, to a Gentile audience. He addresses the first few verses to Theophilus, and he begins to write. And in his genealogy, he starts with Jesus and then works his way backward all the way to Adam. So Matthew has three groups of 14, while Luke has 11 groups of seven going all the way back to Adam. But the point is this, in Luke going all the way back to Adam and presenting Jesus as a son of Adam, he is really establishing the global scope of God's redemption and salvation through Christ. That is why, my friends, it's not all roads lead to Rome idea with Christ. It's not that, yeah, whatever religion you want, follow it and it'll all lead up to Jesus or lead up to God. No, Luke is presenting Jesus as the answer to humanity's problem. And that is precisely what Paul also does in our call to worship today. In a call to worship that we did is from Acts chapter 17. In Acts 17, Paul is in the city of Athens, and he's speaking to the Athenians, who's a very pluralistic religious crowd. And he what does he do? He says, I am going to tell you about the God who's the creator of the entire universe. So he speaks of God as creator, not as Messiah. And then he says the verse that we read today, out of one man, he created the entire human race. Why is that crucial and significant? Because he's rooting the salvation message in the creator God. And he's saying all of us flow out of Adam. That is why, my friends, there is really no room for prejudice. There is no room for ethnic pride. 
over the last couple of hundred years, people had been doing studies on cranial capacities and had come up with really faulty conclusions that one race is more superior than the other because of the cranial capacity and so on and so forth. All of this would have been addressed if they just realized out of one man, God made the entire nations of the world. If all of our father is Adam, where is their room for prejudice and superiority, amen? But as you dive into Genesis chapter one, two, and three, you learn about this creation story of God, right? How God created the heavens and the earth, and you go through day one, day two, day three, all of the created aspects, you get to day six, and it's the verse that Ben read for us. In day six, God creates Adam and Eve. And we're told in a, in a very beautiful way, God says, let us make man in our own image, right? In the image of God, he made them male and female, he made them. That's very interesting for one. God uses the plural, again, capturing the Trinity, the Trinitarian community of God. Let us make man in, in, our, in our, and in the image of God, he made them. So the first thing is, unlike all of the previous five days of creation, whether it's animals or uh, sky and earth and waters and birds, and uh, all of that, unlike all of them, Adam is the only one, Adam and Eve are the only people that God created in the image of God. Very important. And secondly, in Genesis chapter two, we're told that God formed Adam from the dust and breathed his breath into him. So secondly, we're told that Adam had the breath of God in him and also Eve, because God made Eve from Adam. And then we're told that they were placed in the Garden of Eden and God gave them dominion, power, authority, and responsibility over all of creation. God said, name all of them. And God brought the animals to him. So he had dominion and authority and a purpose for why God put Adam on earth. And then, of course, we're also told that God created, God looked at everything after creation and said, oh, but for Adam, God couldn't find a suitable helper. Very important, suitable helper God couldn't find for Adam. He looked over all of creation. Think about that. In God's perfect world, before sin entered the world, there was still a lack without woman yearning, relationships, craving. This is not something that is the result of the fall, so to speak, right? Even in God's perfect world, God desired that man should not be alone. So God made Eve. Now, the English translation of this is the word suitable helper. Now, some men like to make a big deal of this and say, see, the Bible says helper you should go and help me, <laughs> you know, and, and men can try to make a big deal of this. And I think there are some uh, people, some churches, some denominations that try to kind of reinforce this idea of male as superior and women as inferior, as subordinate. But it's very important to notice that the word that is used here is a Hebrew word, ezer. Ezer is the same Hebrew word, helper, that God uses to speak of himself as Israel's helper. He says, I am the Ezer for Israel. So listen, if you want, if you want to say Ezer is subordinate, then you also have to apply that to God. Is God subordinate to the people? Of course not, right? For God to say, I am Israel's helper, it's a really big deal then for God to say, woman is a suitable helper. You know, there's no subordination here. If at all anything, it is, uh, it is talking about a very high, important privilege and a role. And so then we're told, the other, lastly, very important thing that you see in Genesis 1 through 3 is how God interacts with Adam and Eve. In Genesis 1, verse 28 to 30, we see God speaking to Adam and Eve as a friend, gives them responsibilities, tells them what they, you, and then in chapter two and three, we're told that God comes down in the cool of the evening and walks in the garden. And that's the last thing. It is that God created Adam and Eve to really commune with God, 
to walk with God, to enjoy fellowship with God, to be together with God and to walk. That's the picture that we have of, of, of walking with God in the cool of the evening, hearing God's heart, enjoying his fellowship. And isn't that what we sense in the sweetest of moments of prayer times? It is that closeness with God. It's, it's this oneness with God where God pours his heart into us and we understand and we hear and we pour our heart. That was the intent of God's creation. But of course, chapter three happens and we're told that the serpent tempted the woman and made the argument that if you eat of this fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will be like God. And of course, we're told that Eve ate it and then gave some to her husband. Notice, God had specifically said of all the trees you can have, but the day you eat of this tree, you will surely die. And that is precisely what they picked up on, the serpent, and said, did, did God really say that, right? And here's the point. It was an intentional choice to disobey God and rebel against him and his commands which were offered for their good. Even then, in the perfection of creation before sent into the world, I want just to notice, God did not take their volition and choice away from them. God did not take their volition and choice away from them. God created them not as robots to do his bidding without a choice. They exercised their choice, and as a result, they were banished from the garden. They disobeyed God. The choice of disobedience and rebellion against God, the problem, however, is that set in motion a whole nother set of cover-ups. That's why, my friends, please don't lie. <laughs> Lying is one of those sins that to do say one lie, you have to say a thousand other lies to cover up. And that's precisely what we see. It's not just lying, it's disobedience, rebellion that we see here. And so in chapter three, God comes and says, Adam, where are you? And he starts right. He, God is asking, where are you? Because this fellow is running in verse nine. He answers, I heard you and I was afraid because I was naked. God says, how did you know that, I, that you're naked? Did you eat of the tree? And here's the thing, when you know you have wronged God, you run and you hide and then you feel shame, right? And then God says, did you eat? And what does the man say? Oh, classic, right? Listen, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And here you start to see starts with lying, it starts with then goes to running, then it feels some shame, and then starts the blame and the deflection and the shifting of the responsibility. Let me put up my first point for us, my friends. Here's my first. Adam is really representative of the human condition, made in the image of God, of tremendous dignity and worth and responsibility and dominion, yet we rebelled against God. We decided to deflect blame, shift responsibility, and squandered our God-given kingdom mandate. And in such, in, as such, we all find ourselves, so to speak, in the loins of Adam, in that, you know, it's not just the committal of that sin, it is the succumbing to our sinful nature. And that's why Paul goes on to say, right? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This week, we saw the news uh, and not the election, although there's a lot that can be said about that. Uh, but I'm talking about a very, very sad news. Uh, that we saw this week uh, of a popular celebrity pastor who was let go from his job this week. Uh, and, and a few months ago, there was another very popular uh, uh, minister who there's been a lot of accusations against. Um, when this pastor uh, was let go this past week, um, he made an Instagram post and I want to read for you an excerpt from his Instagram post so that 
you hear his own words. And here's what he says. Over the years, I did not do an inad, I didn't, sorry, let me say, let me repeat that again. Over the years, I did not do an adequate job of protecting my own spirit, refilling my own soul, and reaching out for the readily available help that is available. When you lead out of an empty place, you make choices that have real and painful consequences. Let me read that one more time. Over the years, I did not do an adequate job of protecting my own spirit, refilling my own soul, and reaching out for the readily available help that is available. When you lead out of an empty space, you make choices that have real and painful consequences. My friends, there are all too many failures that we repeatedly see both in the world and in the church. And dare I say, even in our own hearts. This is not the sin that we're describing is not something so far away that we see on TV in Washington, D.C. or in some pastors. No, what I'm describing is right here. It's our human pride, our ego, our selfishness, greed, all of this come to the fore and it reflects the human condition of fallenness and self sinfulness that pervades all of us. And that is why Paul says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then later in chapter six, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so God's word to Adam and Eve is for in the day that you eat, you will surely die, right? And death is not the immediate physical death that we expect that is going to be immediately smacked down, right? But it's the eventual physical death that came from uh, that they came from the disobedience, but also the spiritual death and the separation from God. Here's my point. Adam's actions set in motion, of course, the justice of God and the banishment of them from the garden, but also the mercy and the grace of God. Let me say that again. Adam's actions set in motion, of course, the justice of God, but also the mercy and the grace of God. And we begin to see the initial words of God to Adam and Eve, which is to depart. But even within that initial phrase, God also said, your seed will crush the head of the serpent and the serpent will bruise his heel. Again, talking about the coming of Christ and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus and through whom there will be victory over the serpent, right? And that's why John Wesley uh, Sandy, your dad will be very proud, uh, said, right? For if Adam had not fallen, Christ had not died. For if Adam had not fallen, Christ had not died. The point is this. Adam set in motion a rebellion and a failure and a fallenness and sin that pervades all of us. But in Christ, God created the plan for the redemption of all of humanity. It didn't start just with what we know as Christ from 2000 years ago, but it started from the moment that Adam, and you begin to see the Adamic covenant of God. You see Noah covenant, you see Abrahamic, Mosaic and Davidic, and all the way to the new covenant in Christ, where God is on a quest to redeem humanity. But then here's what's really interesting. As you read through the Old Testament and the New Testament, you don't really see a lot of Adam in the text, do you? The bulk of the Old Testament and the New Testament focuses heavily on Abraham, focuses heavily on Moses. And of course, David is super important in the Old Testament, but Adam is not really prominent. But in the New Testament, of course, Jesus references Adam when he's talking about marriage, but there's really two prominent scripture passages where Adam features very significantly. And the two passages is 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans 5. Let me start with 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is writing to a problem church in Corinth. He established all of these problems. He addresses these problems, talks about spiritual gifts. And then in chapter 15, Paul makes the argument that Jesus gave his life for us and God raised Jesus from the dead as the first fruit of the resurrection, right? 
God raised Jesus from the dead as the first fruits of the resurrection. And it's the resurrection that showed the power of God over death and sin and the ultimate victory of Christ. Therefore, because Christ has been raised, the argument Paul is making is, so you and I too will be raised. I mean, Paul goes on to say he's so insistent that the resurrection is central to the gospel. He goes so far as to say, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Then the dead are not raised and we are still in our sins. And we of all people are to be pitied, right? I think, I, let me put this slide up so you can see the scripture. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 15, verse 20, 23. He says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. What is Paul saying? He builds it. He says, indeed, Christ has been raised. Death came through one man, so therefore resurrection. For in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And then at the end, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45 to 57, this is the passage that all of us preach from at funerals. And I'll tell you, my friends, as I was reading and preparing, there's a part of me that got so fired up. I mean, I know this as, as confession, as doctrine, as theology, but it's in 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul really builds a case about the resurrection. And he says, it is because Jesus was raised from the dead, that is why you and I have hope that there's more to life than death itself, because it is on the cross of Jesus Christ that, God, that Jesus died. So, of course, Jesus died because of the sin of humankind. All of our sins, Jesus took and went to the cross and he died. And Paul says, that is insufficient of the gospel. Jesus dying for our sins is not enough. The point is that Jesus rose again from the dead. That means God raised Jesus up from the grave. He defeated, that's why in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 to 57, it says, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Right? That final claim is given why? Because Jesus rose again. So the sting of, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Jesus fulfilled the law, and then he defeated death and rose again. And that is why you and I have victory over sin. And so here's my second point. The first is we are all in the loins of Adam. But here's the second. While death enters through Adam, life enters through Christ. And that is why in the day that you will eat of the fruit, you will surely die. And that is precisely what is countered by Jesus and saying, because of your sin, you die, but because of your faith in me, you will live. Okay? The death that came through Adam is surely defeated by Christ as resurrection, and it is that resurrection that gives us hope that we too one day will be resurrected. My friends, let me just stay, say it as bluntly as I can and as briefly as I can. It is this. You and I, because of Christ, are everlasting. Everlasting meaning you and I have an everlasting life. That means unlike some other religions, our Buddhist friends, our Hindu friends, where they believe that you as an entity ceases to exist after death. Well, especially if you achieve nirvana or enlightenment. The whole goal is exit out of the cycle of life and you become nothing in Buddhism. Or in Hinduism, you become absorbed into ultimate reality. In Christian belief, and this is the central part, you and I have intrinsic value and worth. That is why, my friends, when we face death, we face it with the boldness and courage and, and steadfast hope and belief that we will see our loved ones again. And we will see our loved ones again because Jesus rose from the dead. And if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then you and I don't have hope to be raised from the dead. And it's because Jesus has raised from the dead 
That is why you and I have a, think about the confidence and the, the, every one of the apostles, early apostles, except John, was martyred for their faith. They gave their, they, their necks were chopped off because of their belief in the resurrection. This was so central to who we are as the people of God. And that's why Paul says, because Jesus has been raised, you and I will also be raised. And so the last passage I want to reference is Romans 5. And in Romans 5, the, oh, I don't have this scripture. In Romans 5, it, Paul describes the contrast between the trespass of the first Adam and the grace of the second Adam. Here's what he says in chapter 5, verse 17. For if the trespass of the one man, death reigned, if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as though as to the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also to the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. At some point, I'll, I'll unpack all of Romans 5, but suffice to say it here this way. While sin through Adam impacts all humanity, the grace of God in Jesus Christ how much more impacts all humanity. That's the argument Paul makes in uh, Romans 5. And to say it in Spanish, it's this phrase, cuanto mas, right? Rose, you, is, is that okay? Cuanto mas, how much more? This is, the Jewish, this is the Jewish logical argument that Paul is taking and using. He's like, if through one man sin entered and impacted the whole of humanity, how much more the son of God, his righteous action impact all of humanity where death reigned in sin, grace reigns through righteousness, bringing eternal life. And that is the ultimate point, my friends, of Romans 5. It is that through Christ, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so where the first Adam fell, the second Adam, or Jesus, who we call the last Adam, brought back to life. And this is best captured in the comparison of the two gardens. In the first garden, Adam says, not your will, God, but mine be done. And in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, the last Adam says, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. That is the capturing of how Jesus comes and fulfills our eternal hope and rescues us from the wrath. So what does this mean for us today? In very simple terms, it means you and I have hope because of Jesus. All our failings, all our falterings, all of it is covered by Jesus. And his salvation is efficacious for us because he rose from the dead and you and I can now commune with, commune with God. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you, Lord, that our life has intrinsic value and purpose because of you. We thank you, Lord, that you have made a way for us to have communion with you once again. Lord, we want to experience, Lord, that initial framing in Genesis 1, 2, 3 of what it means to walk with you in the cool of the evening as a friend to a friend, walking hand in hand. Lord, we thank you that you made that possible through Christ. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, we put our full faith, hope, and trust in you. We do not rely on our own efforts, on our own accomplishments. We do not rely on our own strength. That when we fall, Lord, we know you will pick us back up. We thank you for as, as much as sin increased, grace abounded even more. We thank you for your grace that covers us. We run to your cross. We, we ask you, Lord, to cleanse us, to wash us, no matter how much we fall, we just keep relying on you, Lord. You pick us back up. 
and you set us on our feet. And we pray that you give us a, a hope and a future because of Jesus. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.